In the Stream Discharge chapter, we explain how stream discharge plays an important role in determining the characteristics of a stream and why measuring flow is a critical part of data collection. Our goal is to provide the background and methodologies you need to understand and measure discharge at your stream site. We will define stream discharge, what factors influence stream discharge, the importance of measuring it, how to measure it, and how to use USGS gauging stations to gather discharge data. Now let's define stream discharge. Discharge, also referred to as flow, is the measure of how much water is flowing in a stream at a particular point in time. Discharge is a product of a cross-sectional area and velocity. It is expressed in cubic feet per second, or CFS. Later in this chapter, we will cover how to calculate each step in finding stream discharge. A hydrograph is a visualization of stream discharge, showing the variation over time. The top graph in this image shows the intensity of the rainfall, and the bottom graph is a hydrograph for the same time period. This shows the stream's response to precipitation. In the hydrograph, the x-axis is time and days, and the y-axis is discharge in CFS. Shortly after the peak in rainfall intensity, there is a lag to peak in stream discharge. After this peak, stream flow tapers off until it reaches base flow. This is represented by the recession limb. Discharge changes naturally with the seasons throughout the year. Higher flows occur in the wet seasons of winter and spring, while lower or base flows usually occur in the drier seasons of summer and early fall. Here we see a hydrograph for the Merrimack River near Eureka. Not only does this show a variation in discharge for different seasons of the year, but we can also see there was a high flow event at the very end of December 2015. The St. Louis area had 10 inches of rain, which took the stream discharge from 600 CFS to 170,000 CFS, which caused flooding. Hydrographs can be found on the USGS website. It's always a good idea to reference this before visiting your stream site to make sure flow conditions are safe. Next, we'll talk about the factors that affect stream discharge. Anything that affects velocity or volume of water can affect a stream's discharge and the shape of its hydrograph. This includes geology and soil type, gradient of the valley sides of stream banks, vegetation in the surrounding floodplains, type and amount of precipitation, channelization, dams, and overall land use. Groundwater springs, adjacent wetlands, and tributaries also affect the total flow in stream. Anthropogenic or human-made effects on stream discharge include land use, channelization, and dams. Let's take a look at how natural characteristics of a stream can affect stream discharge. In the image of the hydrographs, the dashed line is under natural conditions. The blue line shows how a stream would change if there was a development, like in an urban area. Stream discharge varies according to how much precipitation is received, over what length of time, and what type of precipitation is received, such as rain, ice, or snow. If the stream banks are steep, water will be confined to a smaller stream channel and will travel faster to and through the channel. This results in faster increase in discharge after a storm event. With gently sloping stream banks, the influx of water after a storm event has more room to spread out and slow down, resulting in slower increase in discharge. Vegetation affects the amount of water entering a stream and how fast it gets there. Not only do plants take up water, they also increase the water storage capacity of soil. This allows the soil to store water during dry periods will increase base flow. Vegetation also adds surface roughness, which slows down the water entering the stream channel. Removing vegetation or having concrete in the stream system removes that surface roughness and the absorption of water. This results in flashy streams. Permeable soils, such as gravel and sand, allow greater absorption of water into the ground, regulating increased discharges and smoothing out the shape of the hydrograph. Impermeable soils, such as clay or bedrock, do not allow for absorption and act more like concrete. High gradient streams occur in steep topography, like in the Ozarks. Since water moves faster with a higher gradient, rain will run off the land faster through the stream system and out of the watershed. Lower gradient streams tend to move water more slowly. If a stream is connected to groundwater table, 
This will buffer the discharge and provide a base flow year round. If there are no groundwater inputs, the stream may have no discharge at some points in the year. Tributaries can also provide additional stream flow to a particular stream. Humans can also influence stream discharge. When vegetated areas and wetlands are converted to bare soil or impervious surfaces, the volume and rate of runoff increase dramatically during storm events. This leads to flashy streams. Channelization is the straightening of a stream channel. This, along with the removal of woody debris, causes increased water velocity and erosional force. Water around dams can fluctuate quite a bit, altering physical and chemical conditions both upstream and downstream of the dam. Here is a list of streams in Missouri and their range of flows. The differences in flow within a stream can vary due to seasonality. The differences between the streams can vary due to stream and watershed size. However, the Elk Fork and the Little Piney River are approximately same size, but have different flow ranges. The differences here have to do with topography. The Little Piney is in a karst area and receives groundwater recharge from springs. Its base flow is higher than that of the Elk Fork because the Elk Fork receives no groundwater recharge. The maximum discharge is lower in the Little Piney because it is heavily forested watershed, which reduces overland flow and increases infiltration into the soil, so less water ends up in the stream channel. The Elk Fork in northern Missouri is mostly agricultural land use, so runoff from cleared, non-forested land is higher and contributes to a higher discharge. Let's talk about why we are interested in measuring stream discharge. Why is it important to the stream ecosystem? Stream discharge is an important part of a stream system to understand because it has a large effect on the physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of a stream. We'll briefly go over how discharge affects each of these components of a stream's water quality. Stream flow has a big role in determining a stream's physical features. The movement of water and material changes the shape of the stream channel, the size of the substrate in the stream bed, and the type of riparian vegetation that can grow in and near the stream. As water moves substrate in the stream bed, erodes stream banks, and deposits material downstream, it shapes the stream channel. Finally, variability in discharge influences the migration of the stream channel over time. Stream discharge affects the water chemistry in a stream in a few different ways. First, large volumes of water can dilute pollutants such as chemicals and sediment. Sediment and debris can be moved by water. Larger volumes of water have the ability to move greater amounts or larger sediment. When water slows, like in the bend of a stream, sediment is deposited. Moving water tends to have more oxygen and lower temperature than slow or non-moving water. Flowing water incorporates oxygen as it tumbles over rocks, increasing dissolved oxygen. In addition, flowing water is cooler than pooled water, which absorbs more sunlight. The lower temps can also result in higher dissolved oxygen. Stream discharge also has effects on stream biology. Since flow affects the chemical and physical nature of streams, it also determines what can live there. Fish like salmonids and pollution-sensitive macroinvertebrates require high concentrations of dissolved oxygen, low water temperatures, and gravel substrate for egg laying. Flowing water is essential for these communities. Fish such as carp and catfish and pollution-tolerant macroinvertebrates can survive in warmer water and softer substrates. Specific flow volumes and velocities contribute to a group of cues that combine to trigger egg laying in many aquatic animals, such as spawning in fish. Flow can be just as much of a spawning cue as day length and temperature. Stream discharge also determines the type of habitat available for aquatic plants and animals. Streams with a variety of velocities can support a more diverse aquatic community. Stream discharge plays a big role in determining the shape of a stream and the aquatic community. It also affects the water chemistry and pollutant loading. This one parameter allows us to interpret the other water quality data submitted at a stream. It could explain why we are getting certain values for other data. For example, if stream discharge is low for the stream, it could explain why so few invertebrates were found in biological sampling when normally the quantities are much higher. Stream discharge should be collected during each monitoring trip. This will allow us to better interpret and extrapolate the water quality data. 
Next, we'll look at the specific steps to measure stream discharge. The Stream Team program measures stream discharge with the float ball method. The equipment is simple and some is provided by the program. When you receive monitoring equipment, you will receive the float balls and a 100 foot measure tape. The only item you'll have to provide yourself is a depth measuring stick. This can be made from a dowel rod or small PVC pipe. Stretch the measure tape across the stick and make marks at each tenth of a foot. The same stick could be used as a handle for the kick net used in biological monitoring. The metal stakes and rope are optional, but may make measurements a little bit easier. The first step in measuring discharge is selecting an appropriate location. The ideal location is straight, free of obstacles like gravel bars and large rocks or trees, and has noticeable flow. If you cannot find such a location in your 300 foot stream stretch, this is the only parameter that we allow monitors to venture outside their designated stream stretch to find a good spot to measure discharge, as long as there are no inputs or outputs, such as tributaries, between the site location and the discharge measurement location. Here is an example of stream discharge data sheet. These can be found and printed at the mostreamteam.org website. The header information was covered in the site selection chapter. Be sure to have this section filled out in its entirety for all data sheets collected. For this data sheet, there are detailed instructions for each step. We will work through these together over the next slides. The first section for data in this data sheet is a place to indicate if the stream flow is too high or too low to measure. If the flow is swift or if the depth is above your knees, please indicate stream flow is too high to measure. If there is not observable flow to the stream, or if it's too shallow, you can indicate stream flow is too low. If your stream site is within one half mile of a USGS gauging station with no inputs or outputs, you can simply report the discharge data from that station. If you select that stream is too high or too low, or if you report the USGS flow data, your data sheet is now complete and you will not need to fill out any other fields on this form. Stream discharge can be measured in four basic steps. Let's break these down. The first step is to determine stream width. Stream width should be measured from flowing edge to flowing edge. If there is dead water at the edge of your stream, begin your measurements where the water is moving. Stretch the program provided measure tape from one side of the stream to the other. It may help to anchor the measure tape with a stake or have friends to help hold it taut. Record the width measurements in tenths of a foot. Do not report in inches. As a reminder, do not measure stream width across a gravel bar. If there are obstacles such as a boulder, you can move that out of the section you are measuring. The next step is to measure and calculate the cross-sectional area of the stream. This part may seem complicated, but it's not. I'll also mention that we will explain the calculations, but these are done automatically when data is submitted online, so you really only need to collect and report the measured values. To find the cross-sectional area, we will need to have width and depth. We already have width, so our next step is finding depth. However, stream depth varies along the bottom of a stream. It's usually shallower at the edges and deeper in the middle, so we need to take several depths and calculate an average depth for use in our calculation. To determine how many depth measurements are needed, use the stream width measured in the first step. For streams less than 20 feet wide, measure depth at one foot intervals across the stream. For streams greater than 20 feet wide, measure the depth every two feet. For streams greater than 60 feet wide, measure every three feet. It's very important to get the correct number of stream depths if too few are collected, data will not be accepted. When measuring the depth, always stand downstream of the measure tape so your legs don't impede stream flow. Since our example has 12 foot stream width, we will measure at one foot increments for a total of 12 depth measurements. With the measure tape still anchored at the stream banks, measure the stream depth at one foot increments across the transect beginning at the flowing edge. Do not measure on top of large rocks or other objects. Be sure to measure the stream bottom. Record this information in the columns on the front of your data sheet. 
After all depths are recorded, these will be added to record the sum. In this example, the sum of depths is 7.7 .7 feet. We will divide this by 12 to get our average depth, which is 0.64 feet. There are fields on the datasheet to record each of these values. Next, we can calculate the cross-sectional area. To do this, we multiply the stream width of 12 feet by the average depth of 0.64 feet. The cross-sectional area in our example is 7.7 .7 square feet. Again, here is the data sheet showing the fields to record your values. The steps are explained in case you forgot what to do next. The third step in calculating stream discharge is to determine surface velocity. For this step, it's easiest to have at least two or three people. We calculate surface velocity by timing how long it takes a mutually buoyant object or float ball to float a short distance. The measure tape that was spread across the stream to measure stream width will be the middle of your float distance. A 10 foot float distance is standard, but you can lengthen or shorten as needed for the stream flow. Use a rope or other markers to identify the start and stop points of the float distance. One person will stand above the start point out of the way of the stream flow where the ball will be floated. They will toss the ball in the water about a foot or two above the start point so it can reach maximum velocity before it hits the float distance. Time how long it takes the ball from the start point to the stop point. Repeat this for at least four total float trials at equal increments across the stream. If the ball hits the substrate or any obstacles, the float trial must be repeated. Similar to the depth measurements, we need to find an average for velocity. The velocity will be quicker towards the middle of the stream where the water is deeper and slower along the edges. At least four float trials are required, but you can collect up to 10. Let's look back at the data sheet where the data is recorded. For this example, our average float time was 17.8 seconds. We will divide this by the 10 foot float distance to get the average surface velocity of 0.56 feet per second. Since velocity is quicker at the surface than it is at the bottom where you have friction from substrate, we will use a correctional value to determine the actual stream velocity. The correctional value considers a substrate material. Loose rocks or gravel is considered rough substrate, which is the correction value of 0.8. Most streams fall under this category. Mud, sand, bedrock, or concrete is considered smooth substrate, which is a correction value of 0.9. Select the correction value appropriate for your stream site. For our example, we use 0.8 correction value to get the corrected average stream velocity of 0.45 feet per second. The last step is multiplying the cross-sectional area and the surface velocity to get stream discharge. This is the final calculation shown on the data sheet. Find your cross-sectional area from the front of the data sheet, multiply that by the corrected average stream velocity on the back of the data sheet. The answer is recorded in cubic feet per second. For our example of a 7.7 .7 foot wide stream with a surface velocity of 0.45, the stream discharge is 3.47 cubic feet per second. Congrats! You just calculated your first stream discharge. There are a few common errors we see with stream discharge. All width and depth measurements must be in tens of a foot, not in inches. Do not report any zeros. If a zero is reported in depth, that means there's no water. If zero is reported in a velocity float trial, that means the water is not flowing. Please adjust where you are measuring if you are getting zeros. Double check to make sure you have recorded enough depths for your stream width. If too few depth measurements are recorded, the data cannot be used. The distance floated does not have to be 10 feet, but remember to record whatever distance you decide to use. Finally, remember to collect at least four float trials. We've covered how to collect stream discharge using the float ball method. Some monitors may be able to use data from a USGS gauging station instead. 
The United States Geological Survey maintains over 200 gauging stations on streams throughout Missouri. Many of these record stream discharge every day. These gauging stations may have data on stream discharge, gauge height, and precipitation. If your monitoring site is within one half mile of a USGS gauging station and there are no inputs or outputs between your site and the station, you can use the stream discharge data from USGS. As a reminder, this field is just under the header on the stream discharge data sheet. To recap what we learned in this chapter, you can pause this video and review these questions. Additional resources and training videos can be found online. Contact us if you have any questions.